The year was 1939. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president of the United States. The world was at war, and the Brown Bomber was heavyweight champ. At Michigan State College, Robert Shaw presided over 6,700 students. Charlie Bachman was Spartan football coach. And construction was beginning on a new athletic facility, Jenison Fieldhouse. Spartan basketball teams haven't always played at Jenison. Back when it was known as Michigan Agricultural College, Aggie basketball teams called the Armory Home. In 1918, the basketball team moved to what is now the IM Circle facility and stayed there for 12 years. In 1930, they played in Demonstration Hall. In 1936, plans were drawn up for a structure which eventually cost more than $1 million. The project got a big boost, $314,000 from the estate of Lansingite Frederick Coles Jennison. Jennison had been a student at the college and remained an enthusiastic Spartan fan. Jennison Fieldhouse was the center of Spartan athletics under the direction of legendary Ralph Hayward Young. It not only served as home for basketball, but track, swimming, boxing, and many other sports. Star athletes performed here, including four-time NCAA boxing champ Chuck Davey. The dedication of Jenison Fieldhouse was on January 6, 1940, as the Spartans took on undefeated Tennessee. Nearly 7,000 fans watched as Michigan State defeated the Volunteers 29-20. Chet Aubuchon was State's first All-American in 1940. A fine shooter, Aubuchon was better known for his ball handling skills. Another of Jenison's early stars, Marty Hutt, gained immortality as the model for the stone carving on the front of the fieldhouse. Perhaps the first really big Spartan victory at Jenison was the monumental upset of coach Adolph Rupp's Kentucky Wildcats in 1945. Robin Roberts, a guy better known for his exploits as a baseball pitcher, was an outstanding basketball player and one of state's biggest guns. The Spartans beat Kentucky 66 to 50. The win may have been Ben Van Alstyne's most memorable as a Spartan coach. From 1927 through 1949, Van's teams had a record of 232 wins. Among the Jenison stars under Van Alstyne included Jack Kaywood, Ollie White, Sam Fortino, and the great Bob Ranham. One of the greatest games State didn't win at Jenison involved Branham in 1948. Over 15,000 fans saw Branham Spartans nearly upset what many call the greatest college team of the 40s. Adolph Rupp's Fantastic Five. Kentucky was truly awesome, with a starting lineup of three All-Americans, Ralph Beard, Alex Grossa, and Wawa Jones. Branham had just transferred from Kentucky to Michigan State. Though the Spartans fought hard, they fell short, losing 47 to 45. In 1949, Al Kircher, a Spartan star of the 30s, became head coach. State struggled through Kircher's only season. The year's best effort was a 34-point performance by Bill Ratchek against Marquette, which broke a 35-year Spartan individual scoring record. On May 20th, 1949, Michigan State College replaced the University of Chicago as the 10th member of the prestigious Big Ten. President John Hanna's dream had come true. It was time for some of the most glorious moments in Jenison Fieldhouse history. The 1950s brought exciting times to American life. Television was the rage, and everybody liked Ike. Pete Newell, who guided the University of San Francisco to the NIT title the year before, was chosen to direct Michigan State basketball. Newell was a fiery coach, and no one knew basketball strategy any better than he did. Among the Spartan stars the first season were Jim Snodgrass, Spartan captain, the incomparable Bob Carey, and three who would go on into coaching. Ray Steffen, Gordy Stauffer, and Sonny Means. The Spartans were very competitive in the Big Ten, tying for third place in 1953. Al Ferrari, star forward, became Michigan State's all-time leading scorer and a three-time Spartan most valuable player. Keith Stackhouse, Bob Armstrong, and the school's first black basketball player, Ricky Ayala, were stars in their own right. Julius McCoy could score from anywhere on the court, but his favorite shot, gave him the nickname Hooks. At the end of the 54 season, Pete Newell left East Lansing to coach at the University of California. Spartan athletic director Biggie Munn chose Newell's replacement, a young coach from Bradley, who served as Pete's assistant. 
Forrest Anderson, but Michigan State basketball fans knew him as Forty. Forty's run and gun style fit Ferrari and McCoy and delighted Jenison Fieldhouse crowds. In 1956, McCoy became the second Spartan to earn All-American honors, averaging 27 points per game. Perhaps the greatest individual matchup in Jenison Fieldhouse history came on January 28th when McCoy faced Ohio State All-American Robin Freeman. Freeman outscored McCoy 46 to 40, but the Spartans won 94-91. The 1956-57 season started slowly. Michigan State lost seven of its first 11 games, but 40 uncorked the Spartan secret weapon, six foot five jumping jack Johnny Green. Michigan State bounced back from an 0-3 start in conference play to win 10 in a row. They wrapped up a share of the Big Ten title at Jenison Fieldhouse with a 76-61 win over Indiana and the Spartans' first basketball championship. In the NCAA tournament, the Spartans rolled past Notre Dame and Kentucky, but fell in a semifinal round in triple overtime to champion North Carolina 74-70. The other stars in the Spartan Galaxy included All-American guard Jack Quiggle, Pat Wilson, Larry Hedden, Bob Anderegg, Chuck Bency, Dave Scott, and George Ferguson. During the next two seasons, Michigan State won 36 of 46 games, including their first undisputed conference title in 1959. State's front line averaged 50 points a game and nearly as many rebounds. Horace Walker, Dave Foz, Lance Olson, Tom Rand rounded out the Spartans' lineup. Anderson had plenty of talent, including MVPs Art Schwarm, Pete Gent, Ted Williams, and Fred Thoman. The first 25 years of Denison Fieldhouse gave plenty of thrills, but there were many, many more to come. In 1965, a tall, lanky man, no stranger to Michigan State basketball, returned to East Lansing. John Bennington was assistant coach in the early 50s to Pete Newell and Forty Anderson. This time, he was head coach. Bennington was hailed as a miracle man. He inherited a club which had finished last in the Big Ten and took it to second place his first year. Among six returning lettermen were a pair of senior forwards, Stan Washington and Bill Curtis. They weren't tall by Big Ten standards, but few could match the size of their hearts. Bennington brought Matthew H. from a junior college to step in at center. Two sophomores, Steve Rimel and John Bailey, manned the backcourt. The most memorable game was the finale at Jenison with Cassie Russell and the University of Michigan. Curtis and Washington led the Spartans, beating the Wolverines 86-77. In 66-67, Bennington built the Spartans around H, his senior captain, and Grand Rapids sophomore Lee Lafayette a rugged forward. Rimel, Bailey, and Woody Edwards were regulars in the backcourt. A strong bench, including Ted Crary, gave the Spartans a team no opponent could beat in Jenison. Among the victories in 1967 was Northwestern in the season finale. That clinched a tie for the Big Ten title with Indiana. Bennington's last two teams at Michigan State in 68 and 69 had limited success, finishing around 500. Lafayette earned team MVP honors both years and was named to the all Big Ten squad. Other MSU standouts included Bernie Copeland, Jim Gibbons, and Harrison Stepter. In 1969, Jenison Fieldhouse took on a new look with the installation of a new tartan surface. September 10, 1969, following a workout at Jenison, John Bennington was found dead of a heart attack in the coach's locker room. Athletic Director Munn named Bennington's chief assistant, Gus Ganakis, as head coach. Despite a 9-15 record, the 69-70 season was one of the most exciting with super sophomore Ralph Simpson. He averaged a record 29 points per game. Six times he scored 35 points or more. After the 1970 season, Ralph Simpson signed a professional contract with Denver of a fledgling American Basketball Association, foregoing his last two seasons with the Spartans. But senior captain Rudy Benjamin averaged over 21 points a game during the 70-71 campaign finishing his career in eighth place on the all-time Spartan scoring list. The Spartans had five winning seasons, ignited in 1972 by Detroit Northeastern High's Mike Robinson. Though only 5'11 and 150 pounds, State's number 31 was a court terror. Mike was, quite simply, a scoring machine. 
winning two Big Ten individual scoring titles. By 1974, Robinson was the all-time Spartan scoring leader, demolishing Julius McCoy's 18-year-old record. Steady center Bill Kilgore was a consistent scorer and rebounder. His teammates named number 22 MVP for three consecutive seasons. Other stars of the early 70s included scrappy forward Pat Miller, 1972 co-captain Ron Gatowski, Alan Smith, and a football star named Brad Van Pelt. The 73 and 74 Spartan teams were built around Mike Robinson, but got big boosts from Gary Ganakis and Brian Breslin. Michigan State's best team under Gus Ganakis was the 74-75 squad. It featured decent size, good shooters, and tremendous speed and quickness. Captain Lindsey Hairston controlled the boards inside, while Terry Furlow and Bill Glover bombed away outside. The Spartans won 10 of 18 Big Ten games, including a big home court win against Michigan. Gus's final team in 1976 starred senior captain Terry Furlow. Terry's record high game came against Iowa on January 5th at Jenison when he hit 50 points. However, just as he was beginning to enjoy success in the NBA, an auto accident took his life at the age of 25. April 6th, 1976. Athletic director Joe Kearney hired two head coaches. In football, it was Daryl Rogers. And in basketball, it was Judd Heathcote from the University of Montana. Heathcote inherited a trio of top-notch players for that first season, senior Edgar Wilson, junior guard Bob Chapman, and a sophomore forward from Detroit named Gregory Kelser. Judd salvaged a late recruiting start by signing guard Terry Donnelly, forward Ron Charles, and center Jim Coutre. There were a lot of close, exciting games, but State wound up losing 17 of 27. Judd didn't have to go far to recruit top drawer talent. Jay Vincent was just a couple of miles away at Lansing Eastern High School. From Lansing Everett High School came Irvin Johnson, better known as Magic. On November 28, 1977, Jay Vincent and Irvin Johnson made their Jenison debut. Jay outshined Irvin in their first game as teammates. Michigan State beat Central Michigan 68 to 61. The two Spartan freshmen became dominant players. There was also co-captain Bob Chapman, co-captain Gregory Kelser, sophomore guard Terry Donnelly, sophomore forward Bobo Charles, and freshman Mike Berkovich. The Spartans finished 25 and five, claiming state's first undisputed Big Ten title since 1959. In NCAA tournament play, Michigan State destroyed Providence and Western Kentucky, however, the season ended when the Spartans lost to NCAA champion Kentucky 52-49 in the Mid-East Regional Final. In 1978-79, Michigan State cruised to victories in nine of its first ten games. State ranked number one in wire service polls. However, the Big Ten campaign proved tough, with State losing its first four conference road games. But the Spartans were unbeatable at Jenison Fieldhouse, with victories over Wisconsin, Minnesota, Indiana, and Iowa. The 83-72 overtime win over the Hawkeyes was especially memorable for Canadian guard Mike Berkovich, who sank a pair of pressure packed free throws at the end of regulation play. The game against unbeaten Ohio State is considered one of the greatest games in Jenison Fieldhouse history. The Spartans control the first half, leading the Buckeyes by as much as nine points. Irvin Johnson went down with an ankle injury. The Buckeyes chipped away and eventually took the lead. Magic couldn't take it anymore. He climbed off the training table and back into the game. With a gutty leadership of number 33, the Spartans beat the Buckeyes in overtime, 84 to 79. That sparked 10 straight wins for the Spartans, including a big win on network TV against nationally ranked Kansas. A phenomenal defensive performance against Michigan, keeping the Wolverines to just 16 points at halftime and a brilliant Spartan effort against Purdue. In the 1979 home season finale against Illinois, Spartan fans watched Gregory Kelser's final East Lansing performance, and Special K made it a special night. 
What fans didn't know was that it would also be the last time they'd see number 33, the Magic Man at Jenison Fieldhouse. The Spartans swept through the 79 NCAA tournament, beating Lamar, LSU, Notre Dame, and Penn, setting up the showdown with unbeaten Indiana State and Larry Bird. MSU held a slim halftime lead, then exploded in the final minutes to gain a 75-64 victory and their first national championship. About a month later, Magic Johnson announced he was leaving Spartan basketball. I like to say it was a tough decision, you know, because of all the factors, you know, of um, money, money, uh, my teammates, my coach, uh, everything, you know. So, next season, I'll be, uh, well, today I'll be applying for hardship. I'll be turning pro. The 79 Spartan roster will always be etched in the minds of MSU fans. Besides Magic, Kelser and Berkovich, there was Terry Donnelly, Ron Charles, Jay Vincent, and Rob Gonzalez. During the 79-80 season, there was Ron Charles' record-setting 12-for-12 performance against Michigan as the Spartans swept the series from the Wolverines. It was a 20-point victory over number one Ohio State as junior Jay Vincent won the Big Ten scoring crown. The 80-81 season featured Vincent as he won the conference scoring title for the second straight year and became the Big Ten's most valuable player. Sharing the ball with Vincent was junior guard Kevin Smith. In 1981-82, it was Smith in the spotlight as he helped the Spartans sweep Michigan for the second time in three years and sink free throw. After free throw. After free throw. A record 19 straight as Michigan State beat Indiana. Derek Perry also had his share of highlights. And a freshman guard from Lansing named Sam Vincent was getting his feet wet in 1982. Judd Heathcote struck gold just before the 82-83 season, signing seven-foot Kevin Willis from Jackson Community College and a fiery guard named Scott Skiles from Plymouth, Indiana. The combination of Sam Vinson, Ben Tower, Derek Perry, Willis, and Skiles helped Michigan State to a winning record and a berth in the NIT. The most memorable moment in 1983 was on February 24th against Ohio State. Vincent's 17 for 17 free throw shooting and a 35 point effort from Skiles gave the Spartans a thrilling triple overtime victory. Most of Michigan State's starting lineup returned in 1983-84 and the Spartan faithful at Jenison saw visions of a championship. Sam Vincent, Kevin Willis, Ben Tower, Ken Johnson, and Daryl Johnson all had fine seasons. State registered eight wins in its last 11 games of the 84 season, including home court upsets over Michigan, Purdue, and Oregon State. Judd Heathcote had a formidable lineup in 1984-85. Vincent and Skiles were together for their third year in the backcourt. Larry Pollock inherited Towers' forward spot, and Ken Johnson moved in to replace Willis at center. State raced off to an 11-1 start, including victories over Ohio State and Indiana in the first two Big Ten games at Jenison. Pollock, number 35, was the unlikely hero in the game against the Hoosiers, hitting jump shots all night long against Bobby Knight's boys. A 10-8 conference record qualified State for the NCAA tournament for the first time since 1979, but the Spartans lost to Alabama-Birmingham in the opening game at Houston. One of the season's most emotional moments came just before the final home game against Wisconsin, when Sam Vinson said goodbye. He wound up a fantastic career by winning the Big Ten scoring title, a feat his brother Jay had achieved four years earlier. The 1985-86 campaign was expected to be a down year, but it turned out to be one of the greatest seasons at Jenison Fieldhouse. The Spartans didn't have much size, but they made up for it with a fast break offense that provided lots of thrills and victories. State rolled through the non-conference season with a 9-1 mark, but stumbled early in Big Ten play, losing four of its first six conference games. On January 25th, MSU hosted the Michigan Wolverines. 
State started slow, but wound up drubbing Michigan with an unforgettable 40-point performance by Scott Skiles. Daryl Johnson destroyed Iowa and Minnesota with All-American efforts. State's Big Ten bubble burst the final weekend as Indiana eliminated the Spartans from the Big Ten title. But that wasn't the end of the Scott Skiles show. State qualified for NCAA tournament action for the second straight season. In Dayton, the Spartans disposed of Washington and powerful Georgetown, setting the stage for a Midwest regional game at Kansas City against top-ranked Kansas. Just when it appeared that the Cinderella Spartans were on their way to the ball, the clock struck midnight. The party was over, but memories, they lingered on. Vernon Carr, Larry Pollock, Daryl Johnson, and Barry Fordham. With Skiles gone, Judd Heathcote turned to DJ in the 86-87 season. In the Spartan Cutlass Classic against David Robinson and Navy, Johnson held his own, but the Spartans just didn't have the firepower. The only miracle game came against, yeah, you guessed it, Michigan. The 87-88 highlight was a one-point upset victory over Indiana. Spartan highlights came from Carlton Valentine, Ed Wright, George Papadakis, and co-MVPs Ken Redfield and Steve Smith. The 50th and final season in Jenison Fieldhouse featured a young cast of Spartan players with only two seniors. The 1989 Michigan State-Purdue game will go down in history as a Jenison classic. The hero that night was junior guard Kirk Manns. With a final horn, number 10 had tallied 40 points. The most ever by a non-starter. From his eight three-pointers, to his final free throws. Sharing the spotlight with him were Steve Smith, Ken Redfield, Todd Wolf, and a trio of Spartan freshmen, Parrish Hickman, Mark Montgomery, and Matt Steginga. Paul Dean, a Spartan basketball player from 1967 through 1971, shares memories in a letter. I remember the sounds of Jenison, he says. The lonely sounds of a single player in an empty stadium, shooting, working on his game. I remember the locker room and training room and the silent tension before a game, ripping of tape, the squeak of the shoes on the floor and the long walk down the hallway to the north entrance. I remember me and my teammates gathering at those green double doors and exploding into the field house. The applause, the national anthem, the fight song, the crowd roaring to its feet in anticipation of a tip-off. I remember the sounds of victories, only images now. And someday I'll come back, perhaps with my children, and I'll walk in and see it as it was in those days when I played. Maybe a tear will come to my eyes, I remember. And then one of my children will say, Daddy, is this a barn? I'll never forget Jenison Fieldhouse. Never. <laughs>